Hi friends, it's good to be with you this morning. If you haven't already read our teaching text for this morning, uh, pause me and read Luke chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. I'll be teaching from the NLT version, uh, so that's probably the best version to read it in. And once you've read that or had somebody in your group read it uh, aloud, then you can just press play again. These are hard times, right, this pandemic era, and hard times have the potential to make us vulnerable to making bad decisions, and they also, at the same time, Uh, are opportunities for forging our character. A lot depends on how we respond to our circumstances, Uh, not just for our experiencing of this lockdown period, but also for our trajectory coming out of it. We're in a three-week series now, following Jesus into the wilderness for his 40 days of temptations. Those of you who were with us last week will remember that it's during this period of difficulty and isolation and stress in the wilderness that the devil chooses his moment to try to to split Jesus off. And I say split because that's the nature of Satan. He's always trying to wedge us apart from God and to fracture us off from each other. And top of his toolbox for uh, doing this is shiny, partial truth temptations. Uh, the fishermen and women among us, I think, uh, will recognize this game. It's, a, it's taking a barbed hook and dressing it up as something authentically good. The good news, though, is that God is also in the wilderness. He's there in the middle of the hard times. In fact, uh, time and again in the Bible, uh, God leads his people into the wilderness. This is his classroom. This is where he uh, builds his people up. In Luke's telling of this temptation in the wilderness, he says that the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness. God's goal is not to splinter us or to fracture us, but to build us up. It's during this season uh, in the wilderness when we're often most vulnerable to temptation that we're also perhaps most attentive to God's faithfulness. Each week in this series, we're going to look at one of the three temptations that comes at Jesus. Last week, we looked at appetites. This week, we are looking at ambitions. And I know right off the bat, when I say ambitions or ambition, depending on your background, you probably react a little bit differently. Uh, Some of us hear that word and it's laden with all sorts of negative connotations and some of us hear it and it's primarily a positive word. Uh, So let me take a moment to clarify how I'm using it this morning. The word comes to us uh, from Latin and its original meaning had to do with uh, politicians, Roman politicians sort of schmoozing and ingratiating themselves with people all for the purpose of advancing their own political agenda. Uh, So it had it had sort of an unpleasant tinge to it from the beginning. And that unpleasant tinge persisted for the majority of church history. So um, especially in the early days with uh, the, the early desert mothers and fathers, like our own namesake, St. Moses, who, by the way, went out into the desert to have their characters forged by God, taking their cues from this passage, uh, for them, Ambition was the opposite of humility. It was to be avoided at all costs. For others, though, uh, ambition is positive. Uh, It's it's a good thing. It's drive, it's determination, it's vision, it's, it's perseverance. So let me give us a working definition this morning. As I'm using it today, ambition is a strong, driving desire to achieve a particular end. Uh, We're not defining what that end is. So in that sense, ambition is just like appetite last week. It's It's a good thing, a gift from God, albeit one that can be pointed at any time in the wrong direction. One problem is when Uh, those of us operating out of a mental map that's been shaped by the older definition of ambition, uh, the the primarily negative one, it's when when we reject the strong desire to achieve a particular end as if that in and of itself is antithetical to the life of faith. 
uh, the philosopher, Christian philosopher Jamie Smith puts it uh, quite sharply. He says, the opposite of ambition is not humility. It's sloth, passivity, timidity, and complacency. We sometimes lie to comfort ourselves by imagining we sometimes like to comfort ourselves by imagining that the ambitious are prideful and arrogant so that those of us who never risk, never aspire, never launch out into the deep get to wear the moralizing mantle of humility. But this imagining is often just thin cover for a lack of courage, even laziness. Playing it safe isn't humble. And of course, he's got a point. If you surf in your mind through scripture, it's hard to come across characters who God uses tremendously, faulty as they were, uh, who don't possess a healthy dose of ambition. Think of Moses. Think of the courage required to lead an entire nation out of enslavement into this wilderness enterprise where the final destination is a land occupied by a violent people more powerful than they are. That's, that's ambition. Think of Esther, who uh, in order to save her people from uh, genocide, goes under the deadly scepter of King Xerxes. Think of David, King David, or think of Paul, or of course, think of Jesus. Is his life marked by a desire to achieve a particular end, or did he just sort of bump along, keeping his head down? Of course, you know the answer. Jesus had a mission in mind. So returning to our passage, why this now? Of all the poisons, why would the devil plate this one up for Jesus in this season? And I think the first reason might be a situational one. Difficult seasons, wildernesses, pandemics for that matter, can have the effect of making us feel powerless. What could be more appealing in the face of powerlessness than a quick offer of power immediately? So when a loved one's health is in crisis, we sink ourselves into our careers, or, or when someone treats us as if we don't count, we, we power up and we project will and force and dominance. Many of us are feeling a bit powerless right now. Given the scale of the pandemic, given the uh, enormity of the challenges, uh, it's easy to feel like there's nothing I can do. There's not much that I can do in this season to make a difference. And I think we would be wise to expect that during this season of feeling powerless, the splitter might come offering the temptation of ambition. In fact, I think we're seeing that right and left. But as with most of uh, Satan's seductions, there's this kernel of truth in all of his temptations, and I think that helps to explain why this particular temptation for Jesus in this scene. The bait, uh, remember, is after he entices Jesus' imagination with this kind of glimpse of all the kingdoms of the earth, he says this, I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them. So this temptation in this moment was particularly potent Here's why, because Jesus already had that coming to him. You might be like, what are you talking about here? Well, if you were with us last week, you'll remember that immediately prior to this scene of of Jesus in the wilderness is Jesus' baptism. You remember his cousin John baptizes him as he comes up out of the water. Uh, The Spirit of God descends on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven says, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. And that's, that's not an, an original song, as it were. That, that voice from heaven is quoting Psalm 2, verse 7. And Psalm 2, at this point in the life of Israel, was, this, um, was a messianic psalm. It was a psalm that uh, had framed up their expectations and hopes for a rescuer sent from God to save the people. So Psalm 2, verse 7, says exactly what the, what the voice from heaven said. 
Well, guess what the next verse, verse 8 says? It says this, Ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. So this exaltation to supreme authority, to the right hand of the Father, to dominion over all the kingdoms of the earth, rightly belonged to Jesus and was coming to him as promised by the Father. So we see again, whether it comes through appetite or through ambition, the devil's temptations always target our identity in God and our trust of God. So the authority over all the kingdoms is the bait, right? Verse 6. But the barb is verse 7. I will give it all to you if you worship me. The core of the temptation then is seize for yourself now what God has promised to give you by shifting your fundamental allegiance from God to something or to someone else. I'll say that again because I think this is at the heart of all temptations of ambition. Seize for yourself what God has promised to give by shifting your fundamental allegiance from God to something or someone else. Well, let's look at Jesus' response. Just like last week, Jesus spots the temptation immediately for what it is, and he rebuffs it. He's not saying no to his life's mission. He's not saying no to have vision. He's not saying no to drive and to, uh, to achieving anything. He's just saying a firm no to idolatry. Once again, uh, the scripture that Jesus uses to parry off uh, Satan's attempts to split him from the Father, the, the scripture he uses is instructive. Each one of these three temptations, Jesus comes back at the devil, quoting from Deuteronomy, all from this same section of Deuteronomy. So this week, when he says, the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only, he's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20. And in the previous chapter, chapter 9, Moses had just reminded the people that, that while they had these mind-blowing accomplishments about to, uh, to, to, to be in store for them, they would be achieving these things uh, not by dint of their own greatness or strength, but by God's grace. Sure, there was going to be hard work, there was going to be planning, there was going to be vision, strategizing, determination, but those accomplishments that were about to happen for the people of God, namely entering the promised land, defeating uh, Jericho, those were about God's kindness, fundamentally, rather than about the greatness of the Hebrew people. So that's chapter 9. More strikingly still in chapter 10, in verses 17 through 19, right before Jesus' quotation, God reminds them that, that he is impartial. He loves the widow, he loves the orphan, he loves the foreigner. That is to say, great worldly success is neither a definitive sign of God's blessing, nor is it a means of earning his love. God loves because he is loving. Despite the challenge of the wilderness and the incredible allure of a shortcut to glory and to power and to authority, all in exchange for kissing Satan's ring, Jesus trusts his identity as the Son of God, his beloved Son, and he trusts that the Father will make good on his promise and be faithful in giving him better than the best that Satan could ever offer. And that's where the test comes for most of us. It's not about choosing to be ambitious or not ambitious any more than it's about choosing to have an appetite or not have an appetite. The test is about where is our identity and who are we trusting? Because the ambition that the devil offered Jesus, let's call it selfish ambition, has a very different trajectory than godly ambition. I've put together a little table uh, to help us differentiate one from the other because it's not always easy. And so I think this little table will help us to sniff out uh, the difference between them. So selfish ambition flows primarily from an urge for independence. It's wanting to do your own thing, to take matters into your own hands, whereas godly ambition is flowing from a deep abiding with the Father. 
And that's what this wilderness period was all about for Jesus, and it's what the wilderness period for faithful followers of God has always been about, abiding in him, remaining in him, cultivating dependence and love and trust in him. Selfish ambition uh, ambition feeds on an internal need. Think about um, some of the most ambitious people that you can think of throughout history. And uh, just anecdotally, it seems to me like an enormous number of them have tremendous internal felt needs, uh, insecurities uh, or whatever, growing from, uh, often from from family of origin issues. and so often the ambition is about trying to, to fill this internal need. And, and selfish ambition feeds on that. Whereas godly ambition already has the internal void filled and trusting that it will be filled by the Father. And godly ambition is responding to an external need. Selfish ambition... Uh, begins with with, uh, discontent in in the status. So here Jesus is in the wilderness, and and Satan says to him, look, you might be tired and hungry and feeling powerless right now, but let's do something about that. Whereas godly ambition is discontented with the status quo. It's, It's Nehemiah looking at the walls of Jerusalem in rubble and saying, this should not be this way. It's many of you looking at uh, the injustices in Baltimore City and saying, this should not be this way. I am going to do something about it with God's help. Selfish ambition is uh, by nature impatient. Godly ambition is patient and long-suffering. Think about uh, King David's life. God had promised him the kingship. And uh, there's that first scene where where David uh, cuts off the corner of King Saul's robe, uh, essentially saying, I want you dead and I should be king in your place. That was selfish ambition. It says in that moment, his heart strikes him and he ends up repenting and, and saying, I've done the wrong thing there because he realized he needed to wait on God's timing and trust that God would uh, be faithful to his promises. Selfish ambition is a natively self-aggrandizing, whereas godly ambition is self-giving. Um, think of that scene, uh, we just worked our way through Mark's gospel, and in Mark chapter 10, there's that scene where James and John come to Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, just do us a favor. Um, when you come into your glory, one of us should be sitting on your right and one of us sitting on your left. So if you could just hook us up, that'd be great. And Jesus, do you remember how he responds to them? He says, uh, the one who wants to be the leader has to be the servant of all. The one who wants to be the greatest has to become the least. And he says of himself, the son of man came not to be served, or not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So godly ambition is always self-giving. The trajectory of selfish ambition usually uh, uses other people to, to make much of oneself, to make a name for oneself. It climbs on the back of others, whereas godly ambition is, uh, is, is in service to others. I hope that helps uh, to sniff out the difference a little bit. We aren't all equally susceptible to the temptation of selfish ambition any more than we're equally susceptible to uh, the temptations of appetite. And these temptations and their power over us can change with seasons of life. Midlife, uh, for many of us, which I'm reminded by my increasingly whitening beard each day, uh, is, is when we often feel our greatest pressure to make our mark on the world. And it's often when we're most vulnerable to this temptation of ambition. But Jesus' response to this temptation points us to our hope. The promise of God to any of us who lean the weight of our lives on Jesus is that God adopts us into his family. We become his daughters and his sons too. Not divine son like Jesus uh, is the divine son of God. We don't become the second person of the Trinity like Jesus, uh, the, the son is the second person of the Trinity. But nonetheless, in Jesus, we are God's adopted children. And as the authors of the New Testament uh, knew full well, when they uh, chose the 
the imagery, the metaphor of adoption to talk about our relationship to God, in part what they were pointing to was our inheritance. Because in the Roman world uh, of the first century, when the, uh, the New Testament was being written, biological children could be disinherited if they fell out with their parents or whatever, but adopted kids could not be disinherited. What belonged to the father was bequeathed to the children. Did you know that? If you, if you find yourself just itching for a bigger lever of power to pull on, or uh, instead of trying to gin yourself up by giving up uh, an all-in allegiance to God, uh, just remember that the Father's promise to all of his children is that we will reign with him in the world to come. Your most significant status, if you trust in Jesus, your most significant status is not one that you're going to get by hustling or even by being brilliant. Your most significant status is one that was given to you by decree when God adopted you and one which you will experience the fullness of in the future. Trusting that identity as a beloved child of God. And trusting God's promise to us is not only what enables us to rebuff the temptations, the hollow hucksterism of selfish ambition, but also what fuels us to persevere in godly ambition. And that's precisely the way it worked for Blandina. Blandina, I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's amazing. She was a 15-year-old girl in Lyon, France. Together with other enslaved and free people, she was enslaved, who were known to be followers of Jesus. Blandina was arrested when persecution broke out in uh, southern France in uh, 177 AD. She was 15 years old at that time. And her story was recorded in a letter that was sent from the church in Lyon to the churches of Turkey. So the arrested Christians were threatened and they were pressured to renounce Jesus, to essentially uh, worship Jesus. Uh, Satan and the powers that be. And then when that didn't work, they were coaxed. Renounce Jesus, Blandina, and you'll be a free woman. I mean, this is hard for me even to talk about as a white guy who's never been enslaved. Uh, But just try to imagine what otherworldly power enables a 15-year-old enslaved girl to pass up on an offer of immediate freedom and instead to face suffering and also almost certainly an untimely death. And the, the only answer is a better offer. Blandina knew that as a follower of Jesus, she was the beloved daughter of the King of Kings. She knew that there was an inheritance awaiting her. She knew that the best that that she could be offered now by the authorities was milk toast compared to what was already in her name and what would be hers soon. Many of us have a predisposition to ambition already in us. In this pandemic season, I think that is sort of a wilderness for a lot of us. I think we would be wise to expect that temptations come at us through our ambitions. Who are you trusting? Do you know your identity? Do you know what awaits those who are the beloved children of God.